This video concerns a type of argument that's very common in moral philosophy, an appeal to moral intuitions. Peter Singer objects to this form of argument, so I want to say something about, first, about this type of argument, what it is and how it's used, and second, what Peter Singer has against this type of argument. First, what type of argument are we talking about? We'll be looking at moral arguments from intuitions. Argument from intuitions are typically used to raise objections against a moral theory. Specifically, here's how it works. The person using this type of argument begins by assuming that a moral theory that somebody else has proposed is true. The critic then applies that theory to some type of hypothetical case, and then the critic notes that the theory gives the wrong answer in that case. It either tells people to do something that they ought not to do, or that they ought not to do something that's perfectly legitimate, perhaps even morally obligatory. Then they conclude that because the theory gives the wrong answer in this case, this proves that the theory is flawed. It needs to be modified, or if it can't be fixed, it has to be thrown out entirely. This is easier to explain with an example. In fact, let's use precisely the example that Peter Singer is concerned about. The theory we're going to be considering in this example says that the right act is the act that produces the greatest amount of overall value, overall goodness, for the greatest number of people. This is a slogan that's roughly used to describe theories in the general category called consequentialism. It says that the right act is the act that produces the best consequences. The critics of consequentialism argue that the theory gives the wrong answer in some cases, such as the following case. You may have heard of this before. You're standing on a footbridge over a trolley track next to a large, young, solidly built, muscular individual we'll call Young Arnold. There's a runaway trolley coming down the track. In the other direction, there are five workers in a tunnel who have no hope of escape before the trolley crashes into the tunnel and kills all of them. Young Arnold is leaning precariously over the railing. Doing some quick math, you calculate you can push Young Arnold over the railing and onto the track. The trolley will hit Young Arnold, killing him. But the five workers in the tunnel will be saved. Do you push young Arnold off the bridge? Standard Act Consequentialism says that you should push young Arnold off the bridge and in front of the trolley. In fact, it would be wrong not to do so. If you fail to push young Arnold, you'll be responsible for the deaths of the five workers. However, our moral intuitions say that this is wrong. We don't kill an innocent person, even if it will save five others. So we have a case in which Standard Act Consequentialism gives an answer that goes against our common moral intuitions. And this is said to mean that we must reject standard act consequentialism. Peter Singer says, not so fast. This type of argument that relies on our intuitions to judge some act right or wrong, that type of argument's flawed. Intuitions do not, in fact, produce moral knowledge. This, then, is the proposition that Singer is attempting to defend, the proposition that moral intuitions, like the intuition that is wrong to push young Arnold from the bridge, are not to be trusted. So what's his argument? The first premise in Singer's argument says that our intuitions are based on evolved dispositions. He explains... Our favoritism towards those who are genetically related to us, our immediate family, followed by close relatives, followed by distant relatives, that this disposition exists because we've evolved dispositions to favor those who are most closely related to us genetically. In evolutionary theory, this is a feature called kin selection. It says that we can replicate our own genes to some extent by contributing to the evolutionary success of close relatives and that we have evolved dispositions to do so. We see this in colonial insects, such as ants or bees. Most of the organisms born into a colony are infertile. They have no offspring of their own. Their evolutionary fitness is served by promoting the well-being of those who are genetically related to them, the queen. The closer the relationship, the better. Parental caring for children comes from the same source. Animals that acquired a disposition to care for their offspring tended to be more 
likely to have offspring that continue the genetic line. Evolution has also favored reciprocal altruism in animals that form small close-knit groups. The way reciprocal altruism works is that one member does a favor for another, for example, shares food, then the other returns the favor at a future date. Cheaters who obtain the benefits from others but who do not give anything in return are shunned or ostracized or punished for the transgression. The possibility of getting help when needed at the cost of giving help when one can afford to do so gives creatures with this disposition an evolutionary advantage. Peter Singer combines these observations from the field of evolutionary theory with empirical research done by, for example, Jonathan Haidt. In one of his most widely discussed experiments, Haidt asked subjects to morally assess the following case. Quote, Julia and Mark are brother and sister. They're traveling together in France on summer vacation from college. One night, they're staying alone in a cabin near the beach. They decided that it would be interesting and fun if they tried making love. At the very least, it would be a new experience for each of them. Julia was already taking birth control pills, but Mark uses a condom too, just to be safe. They both enjoy making love, but decide not to do it again. They keep that night a special secret between them, which makes them feel even closer to each other. What do you think about that? Was it okay for them to make love? End quote. Most people who are asked say that what this couple did was wrong. What do you think? Yet when asked why it's wrong, the answers people give don't apply to this case. One example is that incest produces genetically defective offspring. But the couple in this example don't produce genetically unhealthy offspring. In fact, we can modify the case further and state that one of the two is sterile and they can't produce genetically defective offspring. A tendency to produce genetically unhealthy offspring is a poor reason to condemn incest anyway. If this was a valid reason to prohibit sexual relationships, we could legitimately prohibit any adult having a genetic defect from reproducing even forced sterilization, but these prohibitions are considered morally questionable themselves. Another reason offered for saying that what this couple did was wrong is that incest is psychologically damaging. But the couple in Haidt's example experienced no trauma. In fact, they obtained a small benefit. And there's no coercion involved. There's no abuse. These are both mature adults, and each are freely consenting to participate in this experiment. According to Haidt, Evolution gives us a sentiment of disapproval with respect to incest. This disapproval resulted in fewer genetically defective offspring, which produced an evolutionary advantage. The reasons that we come up with for saying that incest is morally wrong are what hate calls moral dumbfounding. Evolution gives us a judgment, and we make up reasons, excuses really, for thinking that this judgment is justified. For Peter Singer, Moral dumbfounding can't be considered a legitimate reason to question standard act consequentialism. Singer also cites the work of Joshua Green. Green likes to put people into MRI machines to see what's going on in their heads when they try to answer moral questions. His research shows that when people make judgments based on consequentialist considerations, this uses the parts of the brain that are concerned with reason. The subject is working on a math problem. When subjects make judgments that go against these consequentialist considerations, like the judgment that it's wrong to push young Arnold off the bridge, this uses parts of the brain concerned with emotions. These judgments are not a matter of simple calculation like solving a math problem or reciting facts. This fits quite well with Haidt's thesis that evolved sentiments are feeding us our moral judgments and that the reasons we give for thinking an act wrong are things that we make up to make our sentiments appear legitimate. All of this evidence is offered to support the first premise of Singer's argument that moral intuitions are grounded on evolved dispositions. The second premise of Singer's argument brings forth David Hume's lesson that one cannot derive a moral ought from the factual is statements of evolutionary theory. Singer wrote, quote, more evolved does not mean better. 
No matter how often the fallacy of reading a moral direction into evolution has been pointed out, people still commit it. And it's not difficult to find otherwise excellent contemporary writers in evolutionary theory who continue to make this mistake. Nevertheless, it is a mistake. We can get more evidence that it's a mistake if we pay closer attention to the dispositions that evolution has supported. Every form of parasite and predator that exists in nature is a result of evolution. Spider wasps will inject a venom into their prey that paralyzes their prey, but keeps them very much alive and juicy. Then they'll lay an egg on the victim, and when the egg hatches, it will eat the paralyzed victim, taking care to save any vital organs for the last, to keep the victim alive as long as possible. Lions, hawks, sharks, and spiders themselves have evolved to be extremely efficient killers. And lions have evolved a disposition to kill their stepchildren. When a lion, or as is often the case, a pair of male lions take over a pride, they don't want to waste their energy raising somebody else's cubs. They kill the cubs and produce their own cubs to replace them. We might find a disposition to rape in the human evolutionary story. And there's evidence that many animals have evolved dispositions to engage in what's called tribal thinking. Some species of primates form tribes. They're very cooperative and helpful towards members of their own tribe. However, when they encounter members of other tribes, they tend to treat those outsiders with extreme violence when it's safe to do so. They'll kill the males, capture the females, and take over the territory. Evidence suggests that humans also have this disposition, a tendency to see the world in terms of a favored us tribe battling against an outsider them tribe and willing to act towards them in the most brutal ways. This disposition may be the single biggest contributor to violent conflict on a large scale. Now, clearly our moral sentiments don't come entirely from evolved dispositions. Some of them are learned from our culture. When it comes to the claim that intuitions provide us with moral knowledge, consider what somebody living in Georgia in 1850 would have intuited about the institution of slavery. Consider the moral intuitions of crusaders in the 12th and 13th centuries as they marched off to clear the holy land of infidels, or the intuitions of those who participated in the inquisitions. Consider the intuitions of many of the Germans who participated in the Holocaust. It seems at least plausible that people's moral intuitions are at least a little bit unreliable. And there may be a problem in taking a moral intuition as indicative of some type of universal moral truth. This leads us to the conclusion that these intuitive judgments aren't to be trusted. It may feel bad to push young Arnold from the footbridge to save the five people, but this feeling bad is just an evolved sentiment having no necessary connection to moral truth. The unvarnished fact of the matter is that you would be killing one person and saving five which seems to be a good trade overall. However, it's not always quite so easy to give up these intuitions. Philippa Foote, the philosopher who originated the trolley problem, has another case that she asks us to consider. In this case, a transplant surgeon works at a hospital that specializes in transplants and has a long list of patients who need organs. Some of them will die in a few weeks or months unless an organ becomes available. While this doctor is serving in the emergency room, a young homeless person comes into the ER. The doctor runs some tests and discovers that the patient has some minor ailment that can be easily treated. Those tests also show that this homeless person would be a compatible donor for several of the people in the transplant ward. By killing this patient and harvesting the organs, the doctor could provide life-saving transplants to a half dozen patients and improve the quality of life for several more. The doctor is also skilled enough to make it look like the patient died from natural causes and nobody would be the wiser. Now, according to Standard Act consequentialism, the doctor is morally required to kill the homeless patient and harvest their organs. This would produce the best consequences. 
It may feel wrong to kill this patient, but Singer tells us that this feeling isn't a legitimate source of moral knowledge and should be ignored. The surgeon case is one example in which it's not so easy to ignore intuitions. And that suggests that there might be a problem somewhere in Singer's argument. At the same time, Singer has provided reasons to believe that we should at least be suspicious when somebody makes an appeal to moral intuitions to criticize an argument. One should at least ask if those intuitions are grounded in evolved sentiments having nothing to do with morality, or on cultural norms that can sometimes be equally horrendous.